communal life where individuals are connected with bonds of fraternity or charity, the case, for example, in Christian conceptions of community, because it does not distinguish individuals as individuated, autonomous, and moral subjects, and because it organizes life after familial bonds or relations within the household, resembles a group of individuals sitting around a table only without one. With the disappearance of the enduring artifact in between us, which both connects and parts us, it is as if we're suddenly displayed to one another in our embodied selves, in a metaphorical nakedness and immediacy, as it were, that should have remained private and secret, hidden in the night. Such an intimacy for Arendt, especially because we have not willed to have appeared and been exposed in that way, is not only intolerable, it is also a threat to both agonism and cooperation. I propose to interpret this metaphor in a different way. Instead of the table disappearing from amongst us with the intrusion of the social concerns into politics, I ask that you imagine each of us bringing something new to the table, something that is dear to us, to share in common. Now, I am aware that I may merely be repeating the dream of an abundant table. After all, abundance, rather than permanence, according to Arendt, is precisely, and I quote, the age-old dream of the poor and the destitute. Still, I think that it's important to envision what she calls an erosion, or growing lack, in the reverse, as a potlatch, a proliferation, prosperity, profusion, a pluralization and diversification, a common wealth. Indeed, I want us to take a closer look at the act of sitting around the table and eating together the food in common, food that has made its way to the table because each of us have labored to make it and bring it there. Commensality is the everyday, ordinary, recurrent act of eating together of sharing food at the same table. As a practice, it does not simply indicate consumption, but it also produces the table as a new space of human interaction, full of possibility and hopefully food. This social space points to a situation in which Arendt's rather tenuous distinctions between work, labor, and action collapse into one another the work of our hands in preparing food and setting the table, the labor of eating and drinking may feel futile and recurrent, but the same space also provides a new site of speech, the invitation of a common conversation and action, the slow and arduous action to be sure of creating an enduring community of individuals who are free and equal. These three forms of human activity however analytically distinct we may hold them to be, entwine and blend into one another in different ways. Commensality blurs the private and the public, and perhaps this presents a threat to the impure purity of Arendtian politics, but it can also be generative. So the question is how? <clears throat> Commensality indicates intimacy between those who share a meal. It is a sign of kinship, amity, goodwill, companionship, and reconciliation. Etymology suggests that some of the most frequently used words indicating togetherness derive, in fact, from sharing a meal. Companion, company, to accompany are just a few examples. The bonds that are affirmed by sharing food are attachments that presuppose existing filiations, such as family attachments, but commensality does not simply indicate already existing intimacy. It also actively creates it, acting as a practical foundation for the creation of new filiations. The importance of commensality resides in its ability to evoke a common substance among those who eat together. The food that is consumed in common is the material basis of that substance. However, the very act of consuming food itself is generative of a new commonality, a shared experience. The specificity of this shared experience 
is that what is consumed is in fact internalized and thus intimately and immediately incorporated into the body. The internalization of food and the experience of eating in common, sometimes from the same cooking pot or the same plate, at least from the same table, create a sense of closeness and mutual confidence. Morris Bock argues, since the sharing of food expresses and is also believed to cause the bodily unification of the persons who eat together, it represents something similar to ideas about the unity between parents and children that is understood to result from the processes of procreation or to the bodily unification that may be imagined to result from sexual intercourse. However, not every food is of the same value, even when they're consumed together. Anthropologists have shown that different foods have differential symbolic values and that these respective values tend to vary greatly across different cultures. Bloch explains this differential value in terms of a scale of social conductivity, a scale in which certain foods are better conductors of social identity than others. Whereas sharing soup is generally considered more intimate for some cultures, this role is taken by rice in others. We at the New School have a strong preference for sharing wine and tobacco. <laughs> in general, however, sharing meat commands a universal value and effectivity. This, of course, is closely related to the sacrificial aspect of commensality, one that commands a long history. The consumption of meat is usually the final part of a sacrificial ceremony after the ritual killing of the sacrificial animal. Sacrificial ceremonies consummate in a communal feast which brings together, or perhaps brings into being, the whole community around the sacrifice. In this vein, most organized religions, especially Abrahamic ones, have their own commensal practices, though some have become more symbolic than others. Anthropological evidence suggests that in societies where there's no strong state in the modern sense, commensality also constitutes a central practice that establishes a sense of continuity between the living and the dead, creates communal cohesion, and organizes a customary ethical code. Kazuhiko Yamamoto argues that in such societies, and I quote, the ancestor god, distinguished as a stranger, sometimes visits the living to make communion with them. The living must offer shelter and hospitality to this guest god. In return for the hospitality, the guest god gives blessing to the hosts, whose magical power ensures the happiness and good health of the living." End of quote. The practice of commensality in such a scenario renders the host sacred through the communion and the blessing of the guest. More importantly, however, is that this practice enables the continuation of social order through the fulfillment of obligations to the dead, and thus to the group, and the cultivation of peaceful and good relations with others. Because commensality is a central part of ethics, its neglect and violation have enormous consequences. Yamamoto further shows that the injury of a guest leads to a spiral of revenge, which must involve bloodshed and can grow into long-lasting blood feuds if communal mechanisms of arbitration are not effective. Justice and the reparation of the social order, which has been breached in this context, can only be fulfilled by the killing of the frugal host. The spilling of blood is the necessary sacrifice by the living to appease the dead. Revenge fulfills the ethical cycle as the equivalent of divine justice. So commensality, even if practiced well, should not be construed as an imaginary or utopian space in which everyone participates freely and equally. The table is not necessarily immune to the relations of domination in the world away from the table, nor should it be. Rather, it is a space in which differentials of power at large are reproduced if not in the seating arrangements, then surely in the portions that each one at the table get, who gets to serve them, in what order, etc. 
It is not my intent to provide an exhaustive phenomenology of commensality here, an impossible task, perhaps, due to, to, due to the rich array of customs and continuous innovations across multiple and diverse communities. But what I would really like to emphasize is this, that such a social space is not necessarily and immediately political, or political in an egalitarian way, but it can be. The effective bonds forged at the table may actually threaten the political, both in conspiratorial ways, we do not need to be reminded of how many subversive plots are hatched at the dinner table throughout history, and by its exclusive focus on mere life, a focus that poses a threat for politics in that it has a tendency to be expansive and imperialist. This is what Arendt fears, and while we must entertain the possibility that our embodied concerns may overpower our interest in freedom, we must also not be blinded to, view, to the view of the table as holding the capacity of constructing a new politics. I want to suggest commensality as an ordinary, everyday practice that is particularly fruitful as a source of identification. One that does not transform and ossify itself into an identity, but still maintains itself as an affective bond. The potentiality inherent in commensal practices is precisely this affective and practical bond, which may function as the basis for the constitution of communities that are based neither on ties of blood, ethnicity, race, and gender, nor on laws and regulations. Rethinking commensal practices may provide fertile ground for the imagination of new political groupings based on ties of solidarity that develop its own bonds, effective and ideational, and principles of action. Commensality as a potential resource, that is, for democratic and anarcho-communist politics, a, waste, a space in which the sharing of bread, of pan, creates friendship, or copain. <coughs> Now, interestingly, while there were once an important concern of philosophers, commensal practices have largely disappeared from the realm of theory. Before I discuss some reasons for this disappearance, I would like to take a detour in the history of Western political thought to explore how commensality has been understood and represented in theory. The earliest forms of commensality, as depicted in Homeric poems, revolve around the feasts given by a heroic figure whose house is the site for banquets, usually exclusive to members of a warrior group. Oswin Murray argues that in this early period, commensality, quote, remains a social right concerned with the process of self-definition and group formation on the part of an aristocratic elite. But this elite is also the warrior class whose function it is to protect society." End of quote. While serving as a basis for the organization of military activity by solidifying as a distinct and cohesive social group of, warrior, of warriors, commensality also functions as an occasion for entertainment and pleasure. The latter function is due to the feast being usually accompanied by the rec uh, recitation of poetry, which acts both as a literary event 